Well, hello and welcome to you all uh, to today's webinar, Building Capacity for a Discipleship of Decolonization Frameworks and Practices for Reparative Justice, which we are so pleased to be offering in conversation with Elaine Enns and Chet Myers, who I will introduce here shortly. Uh, happy to share that this webinar is co-sponsored by the Center for Ecological Regeneration and the Stead Center for Ethics and Values, both at Garrett. A quick tech reminder, because this is a webinar, those of you who are joining us will be seeing only the featured presenters. Uh, please note that there is the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Feel free to use that to submit comments or questions, which uh, we'll leave time for uh, at the end of Chet and Elaine's presentation. So this webinar is the final in a series that we have offered uh, this academic year as part of the work of Garrett's Indigenous Study Committee, which we'll hear more about shortly. My name is Tim Eberhardt. I am the director of the Center for Ecological Regeneration here at Garrett, which is aimed at spreading regenerative eco-theological understandings, earth-based religious practices, and cooperative solidarities for the just healing of social and ecological relationships. If you'd like to receive communications from the center, feel free to sign up on the main web page, and I believe there are links shared in your chat. You can also learn more about the launch of the center last April in our fall field notes newsletter. Again, link is included in the chat. And now I'm happy to introduce the Reverend Dr. Stephanie Perdue who is an Associate Conference Minister of the Illinois Conference of the United Church of Christ and an affiliate faculty member here at Garrett. It has been my honor to serve as one of the co-chairs of Garrett's Indigenous Study Committee this past year with Stephanie. Stephanie, please. Thank you, Tim. It's been an honor to serve with you as well. Last April, after the founding of the Center for Ecological Regeneration, Garrett's president, Javier Vieira, called together an indigenous study committee comprised of faculty, alums, current students, and those with expertise from beyond the seminary to undertake a multi-pronged set of goals and work. He charged our committee with researching past and present realities of Garrett's impact and relationship on and with Native people, to highlight decolonial indigenous theological perspectives and practices, consult with appropriate tribal denominational and institutional leaders, to provide a truthful accounting of historical record, to explore future partnerships with indigenous led organizations, and to propose concrete recommendations to the seminary for reparative action. Our committee has met for the past year, and we are in the final stage of editing a report, which has already been shared with our president and will be shared with the wider seminary community we expect later in the summer and into the fall. You can read more about our committee on Garrett's website, including bios of our committee members. Collectively, we represent eight nations, Native nations, Choctaw, Cherokee, Seminole, Mennonite, or excuse me, <laughs> Menominee nations, and Shawnee, Oneida, Muskogee, and Lakota heritage. It has been a pleasure to serve in this capacity. On the website, you can also read further about the work of the community the committee and view past webinars, which we have hosted as part of this learning experience and this research this year. And I am happy to introduce Dr. Kate Ott, who is director of Garrett Evangelical Stud Center. Thanks so much, Stephanie. 
So yes, uh, good afternoon. Thank you to Dr. Eberhardt and to um, Stephanie, to the Indigenous Studies Committee for this um, collaborative opportunity this year to co-sponsor the webinars. Elaine and Ched, we are grateful to you for your generous sharing of time and wisdom. Um, I am the director of the Stead Center for Ethics and Values here at Garrett where we seek to enhance moral communities by addressing relevant critical justice issues one conversation at a time. And you can find out more about our work at steadcenter.com. And we are so excited that both these webinars, which are available afterwards, but also follow-up articles and continued conversation from folks who have participated in the webinars is available on the Stead Center blog um, at steadcenter.com slash instead. And there will be a follow-up writing to this webinar there as well. In May, we'll also publish um, probably a video um, on leadership by um, Pamela and Jasmine, who if you missed, were our featured webinar speakers in March. So thank you again for um, being here, for allowing the STED Center to participate and co-sponsor. Um, and I'd like to invite Katie Fahey, the Garrett Admissions Officer staff to share a welcome now with all of you. Thank you, Dr. Ott, and thank you to Dr. Eberhardt for inviting me into this space. We're so excited that you're here today, and I know that this event is going to be transformative, just as the others have been for so many people. I am simply here to share with you that if this event is exciting for you, if it leaves you with more questions and answers, and if you feel led to learn more, Garrett is here for you. Garrett offers a variety of options for learning from enrichment courses all the way through doctoral degrees. And if you get to the other side of today's event or the series of events, this is the last one, uh, and you wanna continue exploring theological education, I would encourage you to not only read the articles and watch the videos, but reach out to us in the Office of Admissions at Garrett. Our team can help you discern what your next steps might be. You can reach out to us via get our email at getadmitted at garrett.edu or check our website to learn more about our degree program, scholarship opportunities, and admission deadlines. We are still admitting students for the fall semester. So uh, if you are interested for this year, please be sure to complete your application by August 1st. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Dr. Eberhardt to introduce our webinar guests today. Thank you, Katie. Well, I am so pleased uh, and honored really to introduce both Elaine Enns and Chet Myers, our webinar presenters today. Elaine has worked for many years across the restorative justice field from facilitating victim offender dialogue in the criminal justice system to addressing historical violations and intergenerational trauma. It has been such a pleasure getting to know her and to be able to work with her through the Indigenous Study Committee at Garrett this past year, where she has served as, as an invaluable member on so many different levels. Chet is an activist theologian, a New Testament expositor working with peace and justice issues also going back several decades. He has published over a hundred articles and eight books, including the classic Binding the Strong Man, a political reading of Mark's story of Jesus. Chet is a longtime friend of Garrett's, of many of us on the faculty, and most recently of our newly launched Center for Ecological Regeneration. Both Chet and Elaine train and teach throughout North America and really around the world and have co-authored several books together, including most recently, Healing Haunted Histories, A Settler Discipleship of Decolonization. As ecumenical Mennonites, they co-direct the Bartimaeus Cooperative Institute or Ministries, which is based in the Ventura River watershed of Southern California 
in traditional Chumash territory. Again, a reminder to participants that Chetney Lane will look forward to receiving and engaging your questions and comments later in the webinar. So feel free to use the Q&A function uh, along the way. With that, Elaine and Chet, thank you again for accepting our invitation to share with us today, and I will turn it over to the two of you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, uh, for the warm welcome, and Stephanie, and Katie, and Kate, and Anario. Thank you for making all of the tech work and um, for making this possible. I have so enjoyed. Um, there it is. I've so enjoyed serving on the Indigenous um, Studies Committee um, with you, Tim and Stephanie, and possibly the other folks that uh, are joining us today. And both Ched and I are so grateful uh, for this important work that Garrett is taking on and living into. And thank you for the opportunity to talk together about our book and about some rep reparation strategies. As Tim said, we are beaming to you from the little town of Opu, which is halfway up the Ventura River watershed in the Southern California bioregion, uh, which this space is the secondary setting for our book. Because of the incredible rains this year, native wildflowers are exploding in a super bloom, which is visible from space and satellite photos. These are California golden poppies in our yard. This is the heart of traditional and unceded territory, the community and legacy to which we are as resettlers here responsible. We recognize that land acknowledgements are only a beginning, not the end of the long hard work of decolonization as Stephanie has argued in her recent piece. So we hope to highlight uh, today just a few themes of this volume and then open it up for discussion. So again, as Tim mentioned, please feel free to tap, uh, type your questions or comments into the chat as we go along. Uh, this book is primarily addressed to settler European descent, though all of us have been shaped and misshaped by white supremacist settler colonialism. We invite settlers, other ethnicities, those whose ancestors were brought to North America forcibly, and newer immigrants to adapt this approach to their context and needs. So here is what we will overview today. We'll start by reflecting briefly on the contested notion of reconciliation. Then we'll unpack hauntings as a way of framing the dis-ease among us and within us all under settler colonialism. Next, we'll briefly introduce landlines, bloodlines, and songlines as the framework through which we invite folks to investigate and engage the history and continuing culture of colonization in which we are all implicated. And then we will close by focusing on personal and political reparations as healing practices that must be constitutive to a discipleship of restorative solidarity. Over the last year, the seminal TRC experiments in South Africa, Greensboro, Canada, and Maine in the United States have inspired both public discussions and local initiatives to try to address longstanding issues of white, black, and indigenous settler historic violations and current disparities throughout North America. But discourses of reconciliation are often problematic, and especially in religious circles. We acknowledge in the book that notions of reconciliation are too often filtered through settler sentimentality, which presumes to resolve centuries of oppression with ritual apologies. But settler colonialism is a structure requiring systemic transformation, not rhetorical contrition. The desire of a complicit group for reconciliation without cost or radical change is little more than another settler move to innocence. 
it is hardly surprising that such semantics and politics of reconciliation are rejected as disingenuous by both indigenous and black activists. As is, is increasingly the case in Canada in the wake of years of political and institutional ambivalence about implementing the TRC's 2015 concrete calls to action, which includes nine directed to churches. And unfortunately, it's these churches are often responsible for injecting these cheapening notions of grace into public conversations that seek to reckon with historical violations. And obviously here we are alluding to the great corrective that Dietrich Bonhoeffer made to the theological tradition of grace alone. The implicated do not have forgiveness and our apologies are empty without real steps toward turning things around. And this is why we subtitled our book, A Settler Discipleship of Decolonization. This recent tweet by an evangelical luminary reflects the Christian rights strategy of demonizing woke culture. Tom Buck insists that churches are called to reconciliation, not reparations, revealing that he neither understands restorative justice nor New Testament Greek. In our two volume and ambassadors of reconciliation project, we argued that our churches do in fact have resources to correct the drift in reconciliation discourse toward instant exoneration if we look for help from the scriptural roots of our tradition. There we explore at length Paul's argument, for example, in 2 Corinthians 5 and 6, where the apostle asserts that reconciliation is indeed our core vocation as Christians, but his vocabulary is all about repairing equity. The semantic field of the verb to reconcile, <clears throat> Greek katalaso, used only by Paul in the New Testament, is economic, not expiatory. In Aristotle, for example, it connotes an exchange of money to establish, establish equivalence of value. We still speak of reconciling a bank statement. This economic discourse of reconciliation resonates with the Hebrew Bible's tradition of Sabbath and Jubilee. The vision of seventh and 49th year release from debt is precisely the meaning of the divine decision not to count our trespasses against us in 2 Corinthians 5.19. Christ heralds the renewal of the divine economy of grace. The old debt system is passing away. To reconcile, then, is to rehabilitate equity among peoples. And we would contend that this vision of reconciliation is not dead. Judge Murray Sinclair, Ojibwe, was the head of the Canadian Truth and Reconcili Reconciliation Commission, a historical national reckoning project that has deeply influenced us. And a decade ago, we witnessed Judge Sinclair lead public hearings in Halifax and Saskatoon around the painful legacy of Indian residential schools. We were deeply impressed at his pastoral accompaniment of survivors testifying on one hand, and on the other, his prophetic challenges to settlers in the audience, unflinchingly exhorting us to make things right. This process, he warned us, is not a walk in the park, but a steep ascent up a mountain. Indigenous peoples, he said, have showed us the way, but it is up to settlers to do the climbing. And that, we think, is a poignant and compelling call to our churches to a discipleship of decolonization. We turn now to invoke another contemporary prophet, the young Amanda Gorman, who offered some profound poetic reflections about repair at the inauguration of President Biden in January 2021. 
Recall that her comments came just two weeks after the pro-Trump riot at the US Capitol. We submit that both of these moments, white supremacists calling for insurrection while parading the Confederate flag through the Capitol Rotunda for the first time in our national history, and the young descendant of enslaved peoples remembering the pain of American apartheid and holding the country to account. These two represent the two primary trajectories contesting for our hearts and minds at this point. Ms. Gordon called Americans to move beyond our presumptions of innocence and inherited pride in order to step into our history so we can repair it. Then she warned us, while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. But how exactly does history have its eyes on us? Four years ago this week, Tim Eberhard invited some of us over to his home during that visit for a meal and conversation. And there I met his then year old son, Henry, hanging out on the couch. Henry told me about the article he had just co-authored on a ontological analysis of Evanston. He proceeded to introduce me to this Derridaian notion. Intrigued, I immediately started researching the idea that we can and should engage haunted histories. And for this prompt, as Tim knows, we are very indebted to Henry. We discovered the work of sociologist Avery Gordon, who actually teaches at UC Santa Barbara, very near us, in her important 1997 book, Ghostly Matters, which is frankly considerably more readable and to the point than Derrida, by the way, argues this thesis. Haunting is a constituent element of modern social life through which repressed or unresolved social violence makes itself known in everyday life, especially when they are supposedly over and done with, slavery, for instance, or when their oppressive nature is continually denied. Oh, I'm sorry. Importantly, Gordon also emphasizes how reckoning with these ghosts can mobilize individual, social, or political movements and change, but only if they are faced. In the same vein, Unangak's scholar Eve Tuck names settler colonialism, which she defines succinctly as the management of those who have been made killable as the oldest and longest haunted history in North America. Indeed, a half millennium of colonization has left a legacy of violation and genocide that inhabits every intersection of settler and indigenous worlds past and present, which is also deeply woven into the fabric of our personal and political lives. Unless and until this legacy is faced and healed, Tuck asserts, there will always be more ghosts to return. We find a pointed example that Gordon and Tuck are talking about in the summer 2021 uncoveries by Canada's First Nations of unmarked children's graves, grave sites near former Indian residential schools. 215 bodies, mostly children, were uncovered in Kamloops, British Columbia. And shortly thereafter, 751 bodies in Saskatchewan, southeast of where I grew up. These revelations little, literally represent a haunting, forcing Canadians to confront anew the colonial settler policy of forced assimilation of Indigenous peoples by removing children from their homes. And most of these schools, as you all know, were run by churches where inexcusable abuses happened, seeding intergenerational trauma among survivors. The grim unearthing of these hauntings indeed animated protests. Ghosts cried out through small red handprints and the lament, we were children. 
scrawled on the front doors of the Catholic cathedral in my hometown and kids' shoes and toys placed on the steps. A few sanctuaries, sanctuaries were even burned down. And this is what happens when ghosts of unresolved violations erupt into public consciousness, causing the long festering anger and frustration of oppressed and invisibilized people to boil over, just as it had a year earlier in this country after the murder of George Floyd. This Canadian drama reminded some in the United States that federal, federally funded boarding schools were also run here by churches. Interior Secretary Deb Holland, uh, a Laguna Pueblo, has now, as you know, mobilized the search for unmarked graves of Native American children in our country at these boarding school sites, and ghosts are inevitably rising up. More than 50 burial sites have already been identified so far in boarding schools in the U.S. that receive federal funding. And the remains of more than two dozen children have already been returned to their tribes after being discovered on the grounds of Carlisle School, the largest, with more than 170 still buried there. This is what we mean by hauntings. We know that all of us are monitoring the work of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition movement which is playing a key role and needs the support of our churches and seminaries. <clears throat> Even more intimate to my experience is this haunting. A few years ago, we discovered this graffiti scrawled across a fence, just a block from where I grew up in suburban Saskatoon. And you will recognize this <laughs> venerable phrase, as long as the sun shines, grass grows and the river flows. It comes from the two row wampum of 1613, one of the first agreements made between indigenous peoples and representatives of a colonial government on Turtle Island. And it has been reiterated in agreements in Canada. Cree elders use the term Kichi Asotomatoin to describe sacred promises made to one another in treaty. Yet all over North America, the settler state broke such promises. The fact is, our landscapes throughout Turtle Island are tattooed by such unsettling hauntings, which continually problematize our unresolved history right up to the present. Earlier this month, we commemorated the 55th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., our greatest American prophet. King clearly understood haunted histories. 60 years ago, his book, Why We Can't Wait, which was published on the centenary of the Emancipation Proclamation, articulated the origins of our national disease. We found this passage to be a profound diagnosis, summarizing the task of our book project so precisely that we used it as an opening focalizer. Our nation was born in genocide, Dr. King wrote. Before enslaved Africans were brought to our shores, he recognized the scar of racial hatred had already disfigured colonial society. Even today, he continued, Americans have not morally reckoned with the shameful history of the dispossession and murder of indigenous peoples. For too long, he continued, the depth of racism in American life has been underestimated. He likens it to a lethal cancer in need of surgery. But this intervention, he cautioned, would be complex and detailed, requiring the use of powerful methods to look through the facades of white settler excuses for and denials of our history <clears throat> in order to reveal the full extent of the disease. We may resonate with King's call to liberate ourselves from this tangled web of prejudice, but we still tend to underestimate how deeply it has been woven into our consciousness. Our Healing Haunted Histories project is one attempt to follow the calls of Judge Sinclair, Poet Gordon, and Prophet King to provide a framework for examining the deepest layers of hauntings 
and injustices in our colonial societies. The aim of this book is to encourage, challenge, and capacitate settler Christians and other people of faith and conscience to understand how our histories, landscapes, and communities are haunted by the long and continuing history of Indigenous dispossession wrought by settler colonialism. To transform the self-understandings, life ways, and structures we inhabit, and to practice restorative solidarity with Indigenous communities as part of the wider movement of decolonization. As early disciples of the Apostle Paul put it, to awaken sleep, to the work of exposing long-standing and shameful works of darkness and exposing them to light. This, however, entails, entails a radical break from our dominant American culture of denial. For centuries, our settler communal stories, public, di public discourses, and educational systems have disappeared or repressed voices that contradicted our self-congratulatory narratives. We have become adept at avoiding personal and political responsibility, both regarding our public history and our family stories. What prevents us from embracing Dr. King's call to x-ray our history in order to heal these hauntings is our insistence upon our innocence. And here are two typical strategies of the many we explore in the book. One is what Canadian scholars call colonial agnosia. This is not collective amnesia, but a collective act of ignoring, which is reinforced through our educational systems and media. We think colonization is just too difficult to understand. We don't know, and we don't wanna know. Not about the Trail of Tears in the 1830s, not about Wounded Knee in 1890, not about Standing Rock, in 2017, and not about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. A second strategy is to aggressively dissociate ourselves from past, which is not our fault, and to be dismissive of those who seek to face and heal it. We embrace an ahistorical individualism, understanding ourselves as free-floating entities, untethered, untethered, and unaccountable. This has been called a transcendent denial, which makes us sick at heart and soul, unable to look at each other or ourselves without weariness. Before socialization into this culture of denial, the task of reckoning with the historic and continuing wounds of settler colonialism is for most folks in our churches, an overwhelming proposition. So our approach aims to persuade regular folks that every one of us is both object and subject of these systems and their legacy. It is not something apart from our everyday day lives, nor is it someone else's problem. Central to our approach is inviting a critical tracing of our own family and communal histories in order to understand how we carry the wounds of the violence and dispossession of colonization. This is what King called the full extent of the disease. Sometimes our people were victims, sometimes perpetrator, perpetrators no matter how unwittingly, and sometimes both but this toxic river runs through each and every one of us. We cannot escape this disease. We can only deny it. So we discuss tools for exploring our storylines, tracing and analyzing place and people and spirit to name and heal hauntings. Landlines map past and present geographies of inhabitation to understand how we are shaped by and shapers of those places for good and for ill. 
bloodlines. This is the work of mapping family and community genealogies, looking at race and ethnicity, assimilation and erasure, and focusing on what trauma and entanglements we carry in our bones. And songlines, which is the art of remembering liberative traditions of faith and conscience that inspire practices of just among our people past and present. So we invite readers to explore, interrogate, and decolonize these strands using Elaine's Mennonite settler storylines as our working example. We think there are or is a parallel process for an institution like Garrett's to map its genealogy and geography. And the final report our committee explores landlines in great depth, looking at the ecological, political, and social history of the larger area surrounding the seminary, from natural vegetation to indigenous villages, transportation routes, and traditional territories. The report also looks at the arrival of settlers, treaties, land sessions, and forced migrations of people, specifically focusing on Augustus Garrett, how he gained his wealth, and the founding of Garrett Biblical Institute. This is a wonderful start, looking at the stories the land holds on which Garrett now resides. Garrett's bloodlines will have to do with institutional culture, dysfunction and legitimating theologies, which is also part of the report, specifically the entanglement of your founders with the colonizing powers of the state, county and city. And in the report, important song lines are highlighted, such as how Garrett Biblical Institute was engaged with the civil rights movement or the powerful 2014 Acts of Repentance listening sessions and other prompts that led to the work of this Indigenous Study Committee. Landlines, Bloodlines and Songlines work, um, we believe, offers a way for us to grapple with issues which usually are perceived by regular folk as too big, too abstract, or too removed from our agency. In fact, regardless of our differences, we all currently inhabit land that was stolen, and we are all complicit, which is to say entangled in the historic legacy of white supremacist institutions and policies, and in the ongoing afterlife of settler colonialism inside us and around us. Michael Rothberg's important 2019 book puts it this way. When it comes to historical violence and contemporary inequality, none of us are completely innocent. We may not be direct agents of harm, but we may inhabit or benefit from regimes of domination that we neither set up nor control. He argues that the familiar categories of victim, perpetrator, and bystander do not quite adequately account for our connection to injustices past and present. And he offers a new theory of political responsibility through the figure of the implicated subject. Indigenous activist Nikki Sanchez puts the whole matter a little more succinctly. The history of settler, settler colonialism is not your fault, but it is absolutely your responsibility. Awakening our response ability requires a journey deep into the layers of our personal and political captivity and conformity. We must pursue an archaeology of self and society and nurture the courage to feel the pain of our entanglement in racism and colonization, past and present, and to heal. In particular, we white folks need to recognize the emotional labor of black, brown, and indigenous folks. It is too costly for them to have to share their pain so we can understand the issues. Our work cannot be sustained on other people's pain nor on their strength. This is what the great writer activist Audre Lorde called doing our own work. A discipleship of decolonization invites us to reread our people's stories mindfully, critically, and compassionately, including our own biographies, with a commitment to healing and restorative solidarity. 
resisting temptations to shame on one hand, shaming on one hand, or exoneration on the other. We use the metaphor of peeling an onion with all the accompanying tears. We long for our faith communities to be places where settlers can nurture the courage to face and engage the many layers of hauntings and find both healing and justice. But Eve Tuck and Wayne Young remind us, especially those of us in education, whether popular or academic, decolonization is not a metaphor. It must organize toward restorative land justice. So the goal of our Healing Haunted Histories process is to animate concrete expressions of redistributive justice, which brings us to the last segment of this brief overview. Reconciliation, we explored how principles of restorative justice might be applied to historic and contemporary injustices. In this new book, we build this out, exploring practices of restorative solidarity through three interrelated commitments. To do our own work around issues like agnosia and dissociation, white fragility, ethnic loss and assimilation, and the impact of intergenerational trauma and moral injury in order to understand our own deformation by an entanglement in the legacy and structures of settler colonialism. Secondly, to listen to how indigenous and other communities injured by historic and current injustices are identifying harms, needs, and responsibilities. And third, to work with these communities to make things as right as possible, including covenants of accountability, restitution, reparations, repatriation, and perhaps over time, genuine reconciliation founded upon equity. This process of course is an ongoing circle. It's a life work for individuals and collectively it will require an intergenerational movement. Two arcs of commitment that actually are also supposed to characterize our churches. We appreciate the popularization in Canada of the trope that we settlers must strive to become treaty people because it correlates with the ethos of covenant in our biblical tradition. And it speaks to us even though we reside in a state where not a single indigenous band has treaty status. Because our churches should nurture covenants and truces regardless of what the state does. We explore four aspects of restorative solidarity, <clears throat> reschooling our colonial legacy and identity, building literacy, critical analysis, and imagination, relationship building with indigenous communities, especially our neighbors, restorative actions that support work for indigenous justice, and reparative experiments with resources that we own, control, or influence. So this is sort of the, uh, <clears throat> this is the discipleship path of restorative solidarity. Uh, let us offer just a few examples of each aspect and correlate it to the work that we all are doing together. Institutes out here in Ventura River watershed seek to create a space for reschooling ourselves, offering instruction, inspiration, and empowerment that engages not only our heads, but also our hearts, hands, and spirits. We focus on critical immersion in the landlines, bloodlines, and songlines of our faith traditions, especially as dated in scripture, but also by exemplary social movements, historical and contemporary and our own lives. We gather here with kindred spirits to do serious work at the intersection of sanctuary, seminary, streets, and soil. We think this is the kind of popular reschooling work that Garrett, as part of its plan going forward, could well run, say, during summers for Methodists and others seeking to deepen their journeys from denial to discipleship. It's the kind of thing that can be ongoing, offered on a regular rhythm, uh, and open to whoever would want to go deeper. 
<clears throat> Cree elder and Catholic deacon Harry Lafond from Muskeg Lake Nation in Saskatchewan always emphasizes that relationships are essential to solidarity. We've had the privilege of collaborating with Harry and his wife, Jermaine, for almost 10 years now. And they're well known around Saskatchewan for their efforts to build intercultural relations. This summer, we're excited to take a retreat with them and participate in the Muskeg Lake powwow and join what we think is the first Catholic pilgrimage to incorporate a pipe ceremony. Here at home, we've built important relationships with Shumash elder Julie Tumamite and linguist Matt Vestudo, among others. So obviously, it will be crucial for Garrett to continue to build strong relationships with local tribal leaders as you move forward in the process so that your actions, our actions are not being done to or for, but with. Third, it's crucial that we learn to listen to Indigenous concerns so we can show up in meaningful ways to support, accompany, and stand with communities engaged in righting historical wrongs. Some of our young uh, faith-rooted activists have joined the annual Women and Water Coming Together Symposium held at an Ojibwe reservation to learn from Indigenous elders about the importance of healing ourselves and the earth. In both Canada and the US, extraction is one fraught contestation from Standing Rock to Wet'suwet'en. And faith leaders have been active in demonstrations around pipeline justice, such as in nonviolent actions at the Kinder Morgan facility at Burnaby Mountain. The group pictured here, which includes dear, two dear friends, Steve Heinrichs is former director for Indigenous Settler Relations for Mennonite Church Canada, and Anglican priest Laurel Dykstra, were responding to an invitation to religious leaders from the Tsleil-Waututh Nation to oppose the pipeline project. What are the openings for such solidarity in the region around Garrett? And how might the public theology curriculum prepare staff and students for such a witness? And ultimately, our practices of decolonization must lead to reparations and rematriation. We always need to keep in mind that of the total land mass of both Canada and the US, Indigenous reserves and reservations constitute only 0.2%. The gospel story of Jesus and the rich man makes it clear that returning what was stolen is a precondition for the discipleship of the affluent and the implicated, and also for our healing. We discussed this text in an excerpt from the book that will be published online soon and linked to this webinar. We know that talk of reparation spikes our settler anxieties and that our communities and institutions typically dismiss it as too complicated or unrealistic. But we Christians can and must think and organize together with Indigenous colleagues concerning power, money, and land justice. Here are a few interesting and instructive personal, ecclesial, and political examples of ex the many experiments going on right now all over North America. Lawrence Poniger is a Mennonite pastor and descendant of immigrants who settled Kanza land in the late 1870s. By 1846, 20 million acres of Kanza territory had been reduced to 250,000, and in 1873, the tribe was forcibly removed to Oklahoma. Learning that history, Florence gave $10,000, a portion of her share of her family homestead sale to the Kanza Indigenous Heritage Society. This new organization works to maintain the legacy and memory of the people for whom Kansas is named, to provide avenues to make things right. Another example of a settler descendant, Rich Snyder, brought a remote piece of land in southern, bought a remote piece of land in southern Colorado. Upon discovering there Ute artifacts, 
he began to feel that the land was somehow haunted. And so he ended up giving it along with his cabin back to the Ute tribe in 2019. He was in fact a landowner in a campaign by the tribe to seek new rights and establish new presence in their ancestral Colorado lands. Tribal chairman Luke Duncan said, we hope this can inspire others to make similar actions. A small but significant land-backed project just begun in nearby Los Angeles involved a Jewish landowner who gave an acre of land back to the local Tongva group, the first land-backed project in this metropolis. We visited the site recently with an interfaith delegation and worked closely with one of its animators. We think this initiative is modest but hopeful, partly because it is adjacent to a very prominent park and neighborhood, and so it's very visible. But it's even more powerful when institutions decide to make reparations, as these can have wider impact on other organizations. Today, many main mainstream denominations face dwindling congregations and underused church buildings, and some parishes are closing their doors. Stony Point Presbyterian Church made this difficult decision in fall 2017, but it led to a concrete gesture of repatriation. I think many of you know in 2016, the Presbyterian Church USA General, General Assembly repudiated the doctrine of discovery and called on all levels of PCUSA to quote, enter into dialogue, strategy, and action with indigenous people of the region as part of a process of confession and repentance to redress wrongs, end quote. Our friend Rick Ufford Chase, former denominational moderator, proposed to Stony Point Prez that they explore with local Indigenous leaders a possible handover of the property. Discussions with Chief Murray of the Rampo Lenape Nation culminated in a November 2019 handover of the former Stony Point Church and all its properties to the newly created Sweetwater Cultural Center to promote the education, health, and welfare of native, native peoples and to preserve their cultures and ceremonial practices. And today, Sweetwater is thriving and we've been honored to collaborate in their programming. In 1819, John Stewart, an enslaved person who had been freed, became the first Methodist missionary to the Wyandotte Nation in Ohio. I'm sure this is a story you're very familiar with. When the Wyandotte were forced to Oklahoma under the 1834 Indian Removal Act, they deeded three acres of their land to the church to secure it from desecration. The United Methodist denomination held this land in trust until September 2019, the bicentennial of Methodist missions in the U.S., at which point the parcel, including the original mission building and a cemetery where tribal members and Stuart are buried, was returned to the Wyandotte Nation. The ceremony brought together a hundred tribal mem members, the most that had been back on their ancestral land since they were forced to leave a century and a half earlier. In the realm of public policy, things get more complicated, at least for our settler political imagination. Recent grassroots experiments in voluntary taxing as civil society reparations are thus a good place to start. The Sogoriate Land Trust is an urban intertribal organization led by indigenous women in Ohlone territory in the San Francisco Bay Area. It is working to repatriate urban land to indigenous stewardship. A priority is to procure, procure land where Ohlone ancestors can be properly reinterred. Since every one of the 425 shell mounds, their sacred burial grounds around the Bay Area have been destroyed by development, while the remains of over 15,000 Ohlone are stored at local universities. Some local with Sogo Riate initiated the Shumi land tax. This is a voluntary payment that is both symbolic and substantive. Participants calculate the annual tax based on their rent or mortgage. 
And then these funds directly support Sogoriate's work to acquire and preserve land, establish a cemetery to reinter stolen Ohlone ancestral remains, and build urban gardens, community centers, and sacred arbors so current and future generations of Indigenous people can survive, can thrive. And there are similar symbolic tax initiatives have sprung up in Seattle and New York City and elsewhere uh, throughout the U.S. Might an analogous tax initiative for an academic institution like Garrett be an experiment with some sort of tuition reduction or abolition for Native students? In researching this question, we um, discovered that recently the University of California's Native American Opportunity Plan was instituted, ensuring that system-wide tuition and student service fees are fully covered for California students who are also enrolled in federally recognized Native American and Alaskan Native tribes. Fortunately, this plan also applies to undergraduate and graduate students, and now they're working on how to offer it to members of tribes who are not federally recognized, which is most California indigenous people. So this uh, might be worth looking into, perhaps uh, things are already in motion for Garrett to be looking into something like this, but that's a very concrete expression of restorative solidarity. And then of course there are deeper layers of work being done on larger tracts of land. And one example again is intimately related to my community's story. Uh, the first Mennonites arrived in Saskatchewan from West Prussia, Manitoba and the US beginning in 1892. And as the Mennonite population grew, the Canadian government confiscated treaty land from the young Chippewaian at a Katanao, or Stony Knoll, as the English named it. And this land was given to Mennonites and then Lutheran settlers. The tribe has been federally unrecognized since. After a long struggle to learn about this history, some Mennonites and Lutherans living in the area have joined the effort to address this historic injustice. And we've had the opportunity to participate in trust building educational and community building events at Upwashamau Chikatanao, as well as the Spruce River Folk Festival, an annual music and cultural event which raises money for the young Chippewaian land claim and reconciliation efforts. This instructive decade, decades long story has been narrated in a film you can find online called Reserve 107. But its most recent chapter is particularly relevant to the Garrett process. A storyboard path was completed in spring of 2022, featuring an archway entrance that depicts two eagles carved by local artist Michelle Thevenot. And along the path are signs that tell the history of the land, the historical conflict, and efforts at restorative solidarity. <laughs> And it's so, this is so close to home that the contractor for this project was my nephew-in-law, Lee, and my little, his little son uh, pounded in some of the nails, which is also an important piece for educating those that are coming after us, the children of us. There's also a stone gathering circle next to the path to invite people to pray and reflect. So this beautiful installation will help carry forward the work of reparation. And in June 2022, members of the Young Chippewaian Band, Stony Knoll Historical Committee, and 150 adults, plus several classes of students from, the, from area schools, attended the official opening for the Stony Knoll Interpreter site. And not long after, a couple weeks, Crown Indigenous Relation Minister also visited the site and signaled that the young Chippewaian claim will move ahead. Having seen the power of this project on this contested land in Saskatchewan, we really encourage you to pursue the idea of signage on Garrett's campus. And I know it is already a part of the reparations section of, uh, of the report, but we're hoping this will inspire it to go a little further. In collaboration with local partners, 
Garrett could develop and install such an interpretive sign trail right through campus to break the silence of the built environment, to, be, to begin nurturing a truer catechism of the immediate landscape that students and staff would encounter every day. Because the path to reparations revising the story of people and place, that is seeing again the genealogies and geographies we inhabit in a way that challenges and builds capacity for restorative solidarity. We want to emphasize that none of these examples are heroic. Indeed, attending demonstrations or modest redistributions of settler surplus are hardly costly to those of us with cultural and political privilege. And there are so many other experiments, large and small, happening, proliferating across the landscape. But we do think that these kinds of experiments represent beginning steps on a longer journey. And as we like to say in our work, no step is too small, but also no step is too large to climb this mountain. So, it is this longer journey which will in turn inspire and equip more substantial efforts. One step leads to another. It's important to be persistent and to remember that ultimately this is about our healing also as implicated subjects. But we'll have to get used to working with questions that have no easy or even evident answers in the moment. Something that frankly is quite difficult for us managerial minded settlers to do. So we like to uh, end with the counsel of Mohawk edu educator Tayak Alfred, who sums it up this way. For all of us, indigenous and settler alike, there is only self questioning and embracing listening to the voice of our indigenous ancestors channeled through the young people of our nations, learning from indigenous culture how to walk differently, and loving the land as best we can. Again, uh, so analogous to our faith's call to discipleship. So these are uh, a few of the ideas that we are uh, working with and experimenting with in the book to inspire and capacitate our settler journey of decolonizing discipleship that we believe can heal our haunted history and lead us into a redeemed future of justice for all on Turtle Island. And with that, we will turn it back to Tim, and I think we're going to have a little time for conversation. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Elaine and Chad, thank you, not just for this presentation, which was so informative, insightful, rich, nuanced, and inspiring, while difficult, but also thank you for your book. Thank you for the work, the workshops you're leading related to it. And thank you for your decades long uh, efforts for reparative, restorative justice and solidarity. I'm happy to help facilitate some of the questions that we've received and uh, would also invite Stephanie and Kate to uh, raise questions as well. But the first one that we've received from Dwayne Lotti asks, if you might speak to those Christians, and he has uh, quotations around Christians, who see the confronting denial and disease of hauntings as a literal demonic encounter of waking the dead. And he notes that he's experienced or seen this with legislation being passed on repressing critical race theory and public education. So broadly, uh, I suppose, responding um, to this explicit scenario, but more broadly to 
the dynamics of white fragility, white denial, white repressiveness that that you you raised for us. Um, how how what strategies have you learned to respond to to such Christians who engage your work or this broader work in this way? It's uh, pretty clear at this point in uh, <clears throat> the uh, long play version of our culture wars that um, those of us trying to do this kind of decolonization work simply do not have the option of ignoring um, or dismissing the increasingly shrill um, protests uh, or uh, contests of the Christian right. Uh, those voices are too ubiquitous, too influential, uh, and are shaping hearts and minds, um, frankly, with a wider reach than we are. So we have to engage uh, this kind of thing. I think that's, that's the first rule of thumb. Uh, let us uh, no longer imagine that we don't have to um, respond to that kind of stuff, no matter how nonsensical we think it may be. Having said that, um, it's amazing how often these kind of tropes, such as the one that Duane has um, uh, reported here, provide an opportunity to actually um, unmask the wrongheadedness, the theological wrongheadedness, the pastoral confusion, and the biblical illiteracy of uh, those on the uh, white Christian nationalist front. Uh, and this is a good case, case in point. Um, uh, awaking demons among the dead? Hmm. As a Bible geek, I, I simply cannot not um, call to witness Jesus of Nazareth, who uh, literally awakened the dead, Lazarus, for example, um, in order to talk about the power of the force of life. Um, and that was a little confusing um, to his contemporaries, and uh, we can grant that it is a little confusing um, to us as well. Our, our friends here on, on the right are obviously um, confusing demonology for hauntology, and so it's important that we try to make those um, distinctions. Um, but it's also true that um, we cannot ignore the voices of the dead to instruct us um, in the stories that the land holds. A perfect example of that is the story of the Gerasen demoniac in Mark 5, who um, was living among the dead in a cemetery and who, um, as part of the healing process, Jesus named he was being occupied personally and politically by um, the spirit of legion, a.k.a. the Roman Empire. And um, the, that lib his liberation was to remember the old story of his tradition in which the armies of empire are rushed down into the sea. In this case, they were Jesus sent the legion into pigs, that was kind of a political cartoon because it turns out that pigs were actually the, um, the uh, mascot of the 20th legion, which was part of the occupying force of Palestine. So um, they, were, they were sent into the sea, right? A reminder of the Exodus story of liberation. Um, our sacred texts are not afraid to tackle the power of death, um, and to sit among um, the hauntings of history, uh, to name them, 
uh, and to heal, uh, and so that we can, like the Gerasene demoniac, simply restore ourselves into our right mind, right? That was the description of the healed demoniac, clothed and in his right mind. Uh, so we, we, uh, we welcome those kinds of conversations because um, actually um, our, our sacred traditions, uh, our wisdom traditions um, are much more attuned to this kind of work than the sort of simplistic one-dimensional tropes being offered by the right. But we have to we have to engage that and we have to do our theological work. That's why it's so important for Garrett to be a flagship of this kind of work on behalf of the church, because we have a long way to go before our institutions are more the repositories of wisdom and healing for liberation as opposed to places where the old colonial um, uh, oppressions are reproduced. Uh, we're obviously, all of us in that transition, we're working to be those spaces. You all in your committee have worked very hard um, to animate this kind of uh, labor. But, you know, as a, as a foil for this kind of work, let's, uh, let's engage these, these uh, rather desperate attempts to continue to silence uh, this, this deep spiritual work. Elaine and Chud, thank you so much for this work. Um, in this arena, we do so often encounter communities, even well-meaning communities, that you know get to some level of confessional uh, sentiment, as you've noted, but fail to go to that deeper place of really working around restoration and reparative action. And so the the path you've taken us on, the very practical examples you've given us that you note are not heroic, but are doable and are reproducible, are I think extremely informative for our audience today. So thank you. This uh, next question comes from one of our participants. Amidst the complexity of tribal relations, have you seen an example of a faith community engaging with local indigenous communities where contestations of enrollment and recognition were at play? In other words, what might it look like for church folk who also want who always want to play nice and do the right thing to engage across indigenous communities who themselves might be at odds? That's a complex question. Yeah, that is that is a complex question. And that, let me take a stab and you take a stab. We'll do this together. That is just reality. And, and one thing I always want to say is look at, Jen and I are part of the what we call the radical discipleship movement and, and just the, the fractures and the, the folks that are not working together within our community. So the first thing I want to say is there is in no way, it is a complica complicated thing uh, to try to work on justice issues that we are so passionate about in our settler communities. There's all sorts of fractions that we figure out how to, to work through. And so this question of, yes, supporting um, communities, indigenous communities, where there is different understandings of um, who is a part of the community, who is not. Um, or who we should be supporting. And it, it is very complicated terrain. One of the things that I just want to highlight is we have asked our dear friends and colleagues, Harry and Jermaine Lafond, how do we um, how do we do this work in trying to support what, what is the best way to do this? And one of the things that Harry offers, and Germain is that supporting 
the tribal leadership in the one of the particular um, circumstances we were dealing with, it was a strong um, council to support um, the tribal leadership um, in in the direction that they wanted to go. Can you help me yeah. that a little bit? We're talking about our, our own local situation um, where there's lots of contestation over changing of the guard at the tribal council level and relationships that that we uh, we have with folks. You know, I, I think this is where um, we need to look at ourselves in the mirror, mm -hmm. um, looking at our own democratic culture in the mirror and all of its fights and fractions and uh, difficult and impossible attempts to come to consensus. Um, look at our churches, um, you know, in the mirror of our churches where uh, all we have to do is go to a Methodist conference and <laughs> hear everybody yelling at each other to know that or Mennonite. Uh, yeah, or Mennonite. <laughs> uh, that that we we are all at this point um, trying to figure out how to um, establish and maintain the spirit of beloved community in our um, in our families, our chosen families, our um, uh, faith affiliations and our cultural identities. Um, one of the problems that uh, folks doing decolonization work, settler folk who are not really in relationship with uh, native communities have is, is the temptation to essentialize. Um, you know, all native folk must think this way. Uh, it, it takes, uh, you know, which is kind of like saying, you know, and all white folk must think this way. It, it takes about two minutes of actual engagement to figure out that that is, uh, that's a kind of a death dealing simplism um, and in fact caricature. So what does it mean if not that? It means um, taking time to listen and to listen and to listen and to learn, to understand the histories, to understand why um, things are as fractured as they are. Uh, I wanna offer a, um, an image uh, we live next to a bike path that parallels the Ventura River, and we had historic rains this winter. And it's uh, it's a lovely asphalt uh, bike path, but the huge rains um, caused sewage breaks um, right next to the between the bike path and the river, um, which had to be which spilled 14 million gallons into the river and on, out into the sea. And so there was heavy machinery going down the bike path, which was the only access. Um, to try to fix this thing, big tractors. And so in the aftermath, the bike path is just shredded. <laughs> it, it, it just fractures everywhere and divots and it's difficult to navigate. Well, yeah, it's difficult to navigate with communities that have been pounded upon by the heavy machinery of settler co colonization for generations and generations and generations who are trying to find their healing path, trying to figure out how to rebuild culture and politics. Yeah, that's that's a path that is showing the the uh, uh, the weight and the fracturing of the machinery of settler, settler colonization. And once we recognize that, of course, immediately we recognize we are in the exact same position ourselves, um, having been beat up in different ways and alienated in different ways and fractured in different ways. So I think part of the political and spiritual discipline of doing this work um, is to um, acknowledge, not try to ignore when there are um, differences in communities we're working with, when there are um, uh, polity issues in terms of um, tribal enrollment, um, claims to identity and ethnicity, all of that is going to be part of the deal. And our role is to stay in conversation, always be willing to be educated about why these things are happening. Um, not, <clears throat> uh, and, and this is a tricky bit, you know, we, those of us who, who don't have a history of close relationships with Native folk, you know, we, we find one or two that we can talk to and they become our best friends and, and we, and we imagine that they must speak for everybody and we can't let go of it. We have to understand that um, relationships, individual relationships are important, but also understanding those within social, cultural, and political context are important. Um, 
and uh, just allowing that complexity to uh, help us. So e every single project we've been involved with is um, has has these kinds of issues. For oftentimes, when one uh, native group will question the legitimacy of another native group that we might be working with, um, sometimes that has to be called out. That's happened to us here, um, and uh, sometimes only time and attention uh, can can sort that stuff out. So let's just say, uh, let's just accept that that's part of the terrain and not to be intimidated by it, not to romanticize it, um, to try our best, not, not to misstep, but to also accept we will inevitably misstep and we can, we can figure that out um, just like we do in our own communities and our own churches. And I do think, I just, I do want to reiterate the listening because they're they're just uh, lots of lots of different moving parts, and you know, in many ways, everyone, as Gandhi would say, carries part of the truth. And so, listening to the different folks, um, accompanying them, and being educating ourselves through what folks are saying, so that we can be uh, in better relationship uh, with them. And and not to imagine that we are power brokers who will yeah. empower one group or or over another, um, you know the analogy is the way sometimes funders can control movements by how they how they channel money, yeah. um, and I think it's important in solidarity work to to try really hard to resist um, that impulse that colonizing impulse, um, and yet also to try to make um, critical and informed choices that are informed by actual experience um yeah so it's it's just like life just like um all the other work that that we do uh, and just like our own movements yeah elaine and chet we maybe have time for for one question and and i'll take the liberty of of asking it um as christians with who whose histories are complicit in the settler project um you've chosen to remain christian in this work and i, I welcome your reflection with us about that uh, i know for many as they begin to uncover this history to become awakened to the the levels of entanglement the impulse is to flee uh, to want to leave the church, to want to leave Christianity, to just want nothing to do with it. My suspicion is there's a there's a kind of a spiritual religious fragility that may be at work there. But you've you've chosen the other path. You've chosen to to deepen um, your commitment while simultaneously um, pursuing this path of decolonization. So tell us a bit about about that journey. Yeah, in the in the book, um, we outline um, ten settler moves um, to innocence, and this is this is one of them. That um, especially among progressives, especially among progressives. Thank you. That imagine that we can, as you say, Tim, uh, just put the blame for you know the doctrine of discovery, you know, which of course came out of the uh, papal bulls. Um, but all the faults of settler colonialism at the feet of Christianity. And if we just leave it, then we are no longer responsible. And so um, kind of trying to exonerate ourselves or, or make ourselves innocent by leaving, or that um, there is this, or I think this is along the same lines that, you know, just feeling like Christianity is so toxic um, that we can no longer be a part of it. And Part of what we argue is that folks that are looking for our solidarity and acts of justice, they are not helped by us dissociating or fleeing from the church that we are actually very, very responsible for. I feel very responsible for Mennonite Church. USA and Canada, I'll, I'll try and take on that. My 
my people are in those pews that have become wealthy. And again, it is in Saskatchewan that is my home, you know, a hundred years exactly this year, my grandparents arrived and they came as refugees and then came as privileged, privileged people, given land, um, given, given all sorts of breaks that we have prospered. Um, and so me leaving the Mennonite church, I, there is no room for me in that, for folks trying to say that that is a move of solidarity. My move is to hold the church accountable. That's one piece. Mm -hmm. And of course, the second piece is the deep correction, the discipleship, right? The, the faith, the joy that we have as a community, the study, the uh, work of wonderful biblical um, uh, theologians and exegetes that do, that give us all of the resources we actually need. Yeah, so, you know, we, we call dissociation um, a move to innocence. And, and we, we encounter it all the time in our work. We encounter it not just from um, mainline progressive, but we in, um, encounter it increasingly from post-evangelicals, um, people who've been kind of part of the evan evangelical big box churches um, and are so disillusioned with all of that. Um, and, and the problem is dissociation does not equal exoneration. Just to re remove myself uh, from that responsibility um, actually doesn't um, clothe me in innocence. It doesn't actually do anything um, to deconstruct that tradition or call that tradition to accountability. So there, there, are, there are really two reasons why we um, try to stay uh, in, the, in the tradition, if admittedly um, on the margins of it. Um, one is that um, somebody's got to stay and call for accountability. If we want to be allies of Indigenous people and other oppressed communities who are looking for repair uh, from historic and continuing harms from institutions like churches, um, then we will be good allies by staying in and fighting that fight out within the institutions, within the communities, and within the, the culture of those institutions itself um, by um, revising theology, revising our, our spiritual um, practices, and so on. Um, so that's, that's a reason not to imagine that we can disengage ourselves from the uh, travails of Christendom. But having said that, it's also important to say, um, it's not an unbroken history of oppression, um, Christian history. Um, it is, there, there are lots of uh, <clears throat> margins in which um, uh, people of faith, including missionaries, did the right thing, um, stood in solidarity with um, folks being dispossessed and so on. Let's recover those stories. Let's not uh, let those be disappeared by um, those who actually don't know history. And even more importantly, um, let us re keep reminding ourselves that our tradition is actually not a Western tradition. It's not an imperial tradition. Um, it's, it's not uh, a child of settler colonization. It, it might be a stepmother of it because of the ways that we have ro rode shotgun with empire. But if we go to the roots of our tradition, we actually encounter communities who are um, themselves marginalized by and struggling with uh, to, to be liberated from empire, whether that's the early church, tracing all the way back to the Exodus ancestors. Um, that is our tradition. That is a powerful tradition to stand in and with, um, even as we look at the ways that that's been um, misappropriated and bastardized. Um, and oftentimes disappeared by the church. So there's those are some of the reasons why we um, stay and fight the fight to be better allies, to, to be radical in the sense of continually going to our roots. Um, 
and one of the interesting, most interesting theological projects, I believe, over the next 50 years will be conversations with indigenous folk, both Christian and non-Christian indigenous folk, to um, reread uh, our biblical traditions um, through the lens of indigenous um, uh, cosmologies and intuitions and practices. And I think what we've already found and will continue to find is, oh my word, these old texts are far more resonant with indigenous cultures than they are with modern Western cultures. And so the question is not, should we abandon Christian faith, but how do we abandon and deconstruct white supremacist modernism um, and find our song lines in those older, wiser traditions? I think we will find this uh, synergy between these traditions. I'm really excited and looking forward to that conversation, which is always already well underway. And we know that Garrett will be a, um, a, a real um, important hub of those conversations. Well, that's a marvelous and promising and mm -hmm. hopeful place to end. Chet and Elaine, again, so many thanks to both of you for today and for your decades long work. Um, and we are eager and excited to explore uh, so many of the possibilities you raised for us today and hopefully others that we have not yet imagined. Thanks as well to Dr. Purdue, Dr. Ott for your involvement to the Stead Center for the co-sponsorship and support of this series. Many thanks most of all to those of you who participated today who have participated in prior webinars and who may be viewing this at a later time. Uh, we're grateful for your engagement in this work. We hope you have learned as much as we have and have been inspired to continue to deepen your work in discipleship. We have recorded this webinar. We will be posting it on Garrett's Indigenous Study Committee webpage. We hope that you will come back to it and feel free to share it with others. And with that, let me close us with a word of hope and a word of blessing that we might be witnesses to the deep solidarity and the reparative justice that we know in Jesus. May it be so. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody.